Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Caught in the Act, Tracking the Emergence and Divergence of SARS-CoV-2 Through Statewide Testing and Sequencing. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Dr. Joseph C. Miller, Co-Founder and Chief Scientific Officer of Sequel Incorporated, and Dr. Frank A. Middleton, Professor and Director of the Molecular Analysis Corps at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Joe Miller. Uh, I'm the co-founder and chief scientific officer here at Sequel. To tell you a little bit about our company, we are a genomics technology and product development company. We create products to help our customers with a variety of critical bottlenecks in their high throughput NGS workflows. Our goal is, is to make uh, sequencers easier and more efficient uh, for high, uh, large scale demanding genomics workflows. And one of the key problems in many of these applications is multiplexing. Our Plexwell product, uh, which you'll learn about today in the application to COVID-19 genomics, is designed to address a variety of different multiplexing problems where users are trying to run sometimes up to hundreds or even thousands of samples at a single time on an Illumina sequencer. What Plexwell allows these users to do is to take those samples through a quick and efficient workflow uh, and pull them together and run them in, in cases uh, involving uh, single cell RNA-seq or whole genome sequencing, uh, amplicon plasmid sequencing, and uh, again, as we'll learn about today uh, with our speaker, uh, COVID-19 viral whole genome sequencing. One of the key technical features of Plexwell, which makes it very powerful for this approach, is the ability to normalize varying amounts of DNA going into the workflow and produce highly uniform pools of sequence-ready library material. As we all know, over the past two years, uh, COVID-19 has presented a, a wide variety of challenges. And one of the ways that the scientific community has responded remarkably to this is in finding new tools that can help us uh, understand and track and uh, respond to the, the challenges of the pandemic. And sequencing has certainly been a part of that. One of the uh, commonly, uh, I think, uh, emerging uh, trends, in, in especially the last year, is, is, is our ability to track and, uh, and observe and, of course, uh, predict when certain variants are going to emerge and, and, and be able to see them in real time, which, again, uh, uh, Professor Frank Middleton will talk about more uh, in, in a little bit. Um, with Plexwell, uh, we've been able to uh, support this application by taking advantage of tools that the community developed, uh, such as the Arctic uh, Multiplex PCR protocol, uh, to allow, again, for very efficient uh, high-level multiplexing, uh, again, some cases hundreds or thousands of samples. I encourage you to uh, go to our website if you're interested in learning more about uh, how our products support this application. Uh, and again, uh, it's, it's been very exciting and rewarding for us to be able to uh, uh, help uh, users who, in many cases, have not set up a workflow at, at this level of scale uh, to be able to run uh, uh, assays that can support high throughput uh, COVID sequencing. So with that, I will uh, conclude my introductory remarks here again. Um, we're really excited today to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Frank Middleton. Frank is a professor of neuroscience and physiology at SUNY Upstate uh, University in Syracuse. Uh, Frank's lab studies a variety of, of different things, especially in the area of uh, neural uh, genetics and biomarker discovery for neural disease. Um, and he has really pioneered a number of techniques in the use of next generation sequencing uh, for these methods. Uh, one of the areas that Frank's uh, lab has studied was the use of saliva-based tests, which uh, uh, turned out to be incredibly powerful, uh, as we have seen now over the past couple of years, for uh, uh, performing uh, COVID-19 testing and sequencing. And, and Frank will be, uh, I'm sure, telling us about that here today. Uh, Frank, uh, we're looking forward to your talk, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction, Joe. And thank you also for the opportunity to share with this audience the results of the work that we've been engaged in over the past two years as this pandemic has challenged us in ways that we couldn't have imagined just two years ago. So I'm very pleased to describe to you how we've utilized a particular sequencing platform to leverage the samples that we were 
able to collect on a statewide basis in a very large fashion to be able to monitor the divergence of this virus that we've all come to know too well as it's challenged us again and again with increasing surges and we're going to talk about our journey through that process and how it all began. If we think back just two years ago, March 2020, that's when I became very involved in developing new tools to test for the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in human samples. There simply weren't enough PCR tests that had been approved for mass use in the United States. Part of the blame does rest on the shoulders of the U.S. government, which declined to utilize tests that have been developed and approved in other countries. And therefore, it set us on a very different time course. Over the first few months of 2020, while the CDC was working on fine-tuning a test that they rolled out eventually, the virus likely spread in an insidious fashion undetected throughout parts of the United States. Eventually, when the test came out, it was obvious to all of those involved in any type of diagnostic testing that this test used excessive amounts of reagents. It was not optimized. And one example would be to look for the virus, you had to do PCR reactions in different wells in a 96 well plate. And you had to look for a human product in another well. So you were using three or four different wells in a PCR plate instead of one. This meant a 96 well plate used for PCR wouldn't be able to screen 90 or more samples at a time, but a much lower number in the 20s. This created delays. The test also suffered from poor design that didn't control for stray signal. It simply wasn't the case that the primers and probes that had been developed would always show no signal when there was nothing in the well except water. You could get late amplification curves whenever the primers and probes were combined together. This meant the test lacked low-end sensitivity. And contributing to that was the lack of a control over DNA contamination. The primers that had been rolled out for use on the human or the host reference gene didn't have an intron sequence between them. That means human DNA would be detected just as readily as human RNA in the sample. and could lead to false negative results. And these problems combined to delay the rollout of testing at the scale that was needed. It was also the case that the only tests approved for use were those involving deep nasopharyngeal swabs, which required a healthcare provider to perform. So what we recognized in March was that we wanted to be able to have higher throughput methods that use less reagents, that had less possibility of false positive or false negative rates. We wanted to be able to test people remotely, potentially do collections while they were still at home. We wanted those samples to be inactive and safe to handle. We wanted the samples to be able to be used for sequencing and monitoring of variants that might emerge. And we wanted the specific primers and probes to be in regions of the genome that were less likely to mutate than the area selected by the CDC. So the journey we took was to develop what we considered a better PCR assay. We put the CDC primers and probes head-to-head -head against the assay that we fine-tuned for development in saliva. For example, using two different channels and a PCR plate, we could put the CDC test in the FAM channel. We could put the test we were using that interrogated the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase gene in the HEX channel. And we could put the optimized human control gene in the Psi 5 channel. And we could detect all of these in the same well very efficiently with complete certainty about the signals, except that the CDC primers and probes tended to give false positives at late cycle numbers.
So we actually had to remove those in order to improve the specificity of the assay. We determined the limit of detection of our assay using a multi-probe design in the hex channel. We demonstrated its utility using 30 positive and negative samples. That was the initial bar that you had to meet for emergency use authorization by the FDA. We demonstrated the stability of the RNA across simulated transport, extreme heat, extreme cold, several days. This was a major issue for nasopharyngeal swabs, which were collected in viral transport media, with delays approaching a week for those samples to reach a testing lab there was no control over the stability of the RNA in those tubes and often made it impossible to obtain usable virus for sequencing. We also had to demonstrate the robustness of the sample to multiple interfering substances that you might find in the mouth, such as toothpaste, mouthwash, even nasal spray, or blood. And it passed all those tests. Post-approval, we had to submit to a blind sensitivity and specificity analysis. And when we did that, using the swab that we had ut utilized in prior tests, as Joe mentioned, for the past decade in other biomarker work, um, we achieved New York State authorization initially in July of 2020, New York State DOH approval for the individual tests a month later, the FDA EUA a month after that, and the blind post-EUA sensitivity and specificity analysis showed that it was the best in class of all saliva tests that had the most sensitivity. It was also resistant to mutations. Already, by mid-2020, we were seeing mutations creep up and make some of the initial primer and probe sites that the CDC had targeted unreliable. During this approval process, we also worked a great deal on the pooled saliva test. We recognized that the testing need might ramp up. We were not among those who thought this pandemic would go away by April or May. In fact, we anticipated correctly. What we were able to achieve with the pooled saliva test was the ability to pool up to 12 samples, and that received an EUA from the FDA as well. And when we did so, we didn't lose any sensitivity versus the individual test. Part of the ingenuity behind the pooled test involves the use of the liquid that's in the tube. If you look at the swab in the upper right, that liquid stabilizes the saliva that is picked up in the highly absorbent swab that's sticking up out of the top of it. So we were able to sample that fluid in a pooled fashion, but retain the individual swab itself for reflex testing when the pool is positive. That liquid also makes handling the pool liquid completely safe in a laboratory environment. We showed that it completely inactivates the viruses that we were able to test, as well as yeast, and that's what you're seeing an example of. There's two strains of yeast, that after just a few minutes of contact with that exact liquid are unable to grow on their proper media compared to how well they grow with just water. Another element of that liquid is that it actually inactivates the RNAs that are in such high abundance in the oral cavity as well as the respiratory tract. And everyone knows these RNAs are there. They're actually part of the immune response. In fact, the CDC control genes for the presence of the human nucleic acid in their samples targets the RNAs P gene. So you need to inactivate RNAs if you're trying to track RNA viruses, and this solution does it. So I mentioned we had no loss of sensitivity in the pool test versus the individual test. What you're looking at on the upper left of this slide on the x-axis is the CT value, the number of cycles to threshold that it took to detect a pool that was positive following our pool processing. And in those pools, it was determined that a single positive individual existed, and that's what's plotted on the y-axis. Extremely high correlation. And 
although there is a shift that you can see on the upper right of one to two cycles, the pool was always positive. And that's shown 90 pairs of pools. Many pools, particularly when there was a surge, would also show an increase in viral abundance, which you could see by fewer cycles to threshold. And that's the PCR amplification plot at the bottom. So we could actually model the number of positives that we expected to see based on the study of many, many pools. Test sensitivity is very critical. And not losing sensitivity with a pool test was critical for deploying this test in a large scale. The most commonly used PCR test in the United States is tests that were developed around the CDC primer and probe test, or the CDC test itself, or tests offered by la large laboratories, commercial laboratories. And those have a sensitivity that does not in do any better than 18,000 copies of the virus per ml. And that includes the Yale saliva direct test, for example. The test that we had developed was determined in the blind sensitivity testing to have a sensitivity of at least 600 copies per mil, ranking it among the most sensitive of all tests. If you're using one of the more common tests, you can see on the y-axis that you will miss at least 40% of positive cases. That's still better than rapid antigen test. You can see I've drawn an arrow there indicating the sensitivity, the nominal sensitivity, the copies per mil, plotted for one particular widely used rapid antigen test. And that would be expected to miss at least 60%. Missing positive cases certainly contributed to the exponential rise in undetected positivity around this country. Moreover, it gave people who misinterpreted a negative test result a false sense of security that they could go out and not worry about spreading it. The pool testing is what SUNY challenged us to do. Once they had seen our results, they asked us to develop a means of distributing, performing, and delivering results from this test every week to the entire state university campus population. And this is the largest state university system in the country. So the challenge was to be able to test everyone on campus as often as possible. The basic overview of the process that we developed is illustrated in this slide. We would have students or faculty use the individual swabs. And there's a set of 12 swabs, maybe one of those picked up virus, you can see with the red swab tip. The lab would collect these swabs, create a pool fluid from aliquots of those swabs, and the pool tube would be analyzed for the presence of the virus. If it was negative, then all the individuals who contributed swabs to the pool were presumed negative. If it was positive, we simply opened up the individual tubes and subjected those to individual testing. This was the system we implemented. These were clinical results. They were reported to New York State Department of Health and the Electronic Clinical Laboratory Reporting System. What we were able to achieve was not quite the gold standard. We had much to strive for. The gold standard would be testing every day and producing same day results. If you could do that, as shown in the upper left of this slide, you could reduce more than 95% of all the infectiousness in a population. What was happening in this country, maybe people were going to providers early in the pandemic, and sometimes it was taking a week for results to come back. And sadly, that was not removing any of the infectiousness in the population compared to simple self-isolation. What we achieved with the pool rollout statewide, we could return results sometimes same day if it was a local campus or the very next day. And we could test weekly. And it's estimated that we removed 60 to 70% of the population.
we had to scale this process up. And that was not trivial. As all the students rolled out to campus that fall in 2020, we ramped up our ability to perform the testing. We had approximately 40 people working in the lab seven days a week. And we were running PCR, and there's a look inside the PCR lab, uh, almost 100 hours a week doing all this testing. But by scaling up, we were able to process more than 30,000 samples a day in a single laboratory. And that enabled us over the course of that first semester and through the early part of the winter and spring to perform nearly 2 million tests statewide from more than 80 colleges and universities, including not only the SUNY campus population, but at least 10 other private institutions who sought out the test. It also enabled us to scale the sequencing efforts. And indeed, while we were rolling out the test in the, that first fall of 2020, we were able to sequence more than 2,000 positive samples. We also developed antibody testing, and I'll mention a few of those highlights from that later on. Our sequencing efforts enabled us to look at the appearance of mutations across the genome in this virus, and that's what's shown here. The, essentially, the diversity of mutations in different regions of the SARS-CoV-2 genome across all the different genes that are located there. And I've written in the name of the spike protein gene, which is so critical to understanding the virus, and the nucleocapsid, or N gene. And you'll note that these have a higher density of mutations than other regions of the genome. Our PCR assay is approximately in the middle of the virus genome, which is not targeted with high numbers of mutations. If the virus is mutating in areas where the PCR tests are designed to interrogate, that could be a problem in the sensitivity of the test. And I'll return to that point later. Our efforts at sequencing gained some insight from what we were able to understand looking at clinical samples. Right at the beginning, in March 2020, um, we were able to obtain saliva samples from hospitalized patients with severe COVID. And in that scenario, we didn't have to do any PCR target enrichment. And what you're looking at here are the, all the aligned reads across the genome from one severely ill SARS-CoV-2 patient. And there was a depth of approximately 200 reads across more than 99.7% of the genome. We would call that pretty good coverage. But this was a patient who actually didn't survive. So we needed something that could be used when the virus load was not as high as that. We needed something that we can implement at scale for 90% of the positive samples that we could identify in clinical testing. We were funding all of this initial work through SUNY and our own campus initiatives because of the importance that we recognized it represented for public health. We later received funding from New York State Department of Health to continue this work. In order to adopt such a scaled up effort, we had to identify the best enrichment PCR protocols. And so we did a lot of searching. We looked and found the Arctic V3 protocol using the SQL, Flexwell method, and that seemed highly attractive to us because of the scalability. It actually enabled us to implement low, moderate, and even higher throughput sequencing as needed. And what you can see on the bottom of this slide are the plots of daily cases in blue and testing positivity in gold across time throughout the course of the pandemic. And clearly, when we adopted this sequencing uh, methodology, we had no idea what was coming. But what we've seen is it's been invaluable for our efforts to keep track of the sequencing demands that we were faced with. The traditional method of implementing the Plexwell technology is illustrated on the left of this slide. 
which involves using individual tubes. We made some modifications to that to meet the sequencing throughput needs that we had. So rather than prepping one plate at a time, which you're seeing in the middle, uh, a single plate gets reduced to one tube. We found using a 96 well pipetting device, the Gilson Plate Master specifically, we could actually prep 12 plates at a time. Then we could purify 12 tubes at a time, and you're looking at a magnetic stand rack, magnetic uh, that can hold six tubes on one side and six on the other with the magnets visible uh, for one side and then the other. We could purify all of those at once and take them to the next module, the pool barcoding module, which instead of being processed one tube at a time, uh, we found we could do three PCR strips or up to half a plate at a time because we would do the purification using plate-based magnetic bead purification. And that enabled us to process routinely during the peak surges 24 plates at a time every week. And that's what we've been doing through all of these late surges in 2021 and early 2022. Just a closer view, if you look on the first picture on the upper left, you can see the plate master is in a position to pick up a whole plate of tips. There's the 3X coating buffer immediately above it. And we would go in with a full rack of tips, you can see in the second picture, pick up the coating buffer and move it over to the sample barcode plate that comes from Sequel. And we would add that coating buffer directly to it with a single push. Then with the same tips, we go into the diluted cDNA from the Arctic now V4.1 protocol. Pick that up and introduce that into the sample barcoding plate and mix that 15 times. So that's just an illustration of how quickly we can load a plate. And we can literally load eight to 10 at a time before the protocol required by the sample barcoding method finishes with the first incubation of the very first plate. Pool barcode step benefits from the magnetic bead cleanup being done in plate format, and that's what you're seeing below. Our initial sequencing performance indicators were very strong, and they continue to be so. We typically would run two by 150 read lengths, either on the NextSeq 500 and certainly the NextSeq 2000 as we scaled up. And we would see more than 93% of the reads pass the filter. And we'd see a very high uniformity of the percent passing filter per index. And that's what's shown on this upper plot. In this particular case, there were eight plates or approximately 768 samples, including the negative controls. And you're looking at the representation of all of those, which is going to be less than a quarter of a percent, if you do the math, across all of the reads that were found. So the sum of everything that you're seeing there would be 1.0 or 100% of the read. But individually, you can see very good balance. Now intermittently, if you're looking really closely, you'll see a gap just short of 100, just short of 200, just short of 300, 400. That's the negative control. And that indicates that water resulted in no sequence representation. Water would, should fail the PCR, and water should not be contaminated during the Plexwell methodology if it's done correctly. And that's what you're seeing evidence of. Water does fail and it comes up empty. We also were able to evaluate the quality and depth of the coverage that was generated in our higher throughput methodology and evaluate that with regard to the amount of virus that was present in the sample initially, and that's what you're seeing in the lower plots. Using NextClade to determine whether a sequence was of high or moderate or poor quality, we're plotting the incidence of those calls against the cycles to threshold 
of the clinical test, the PCR test that was done initially, and the PCR test that used the RNA, which we later sequenced. And you can see on the left lower plot that there's a trend, certainly at or around 33, 34 cycles, the probability of generating high to moderate quality genomic coverage drops compared to the probability of generating poor coverage. And so we adopted initially a cutoff of 38 cycles. We later lowered that to 36. And finally, with the demands of Omicron, to 33 cycles. If you look in the lower right, you can see the cycles to threshold cutoff value plotted against the mean or median sequencing coverage for a set, in this case, of approximately 1,700 SARS-CoV-2 sequences. And you'll note that below 33 cycles, there's a much greater probability of getting higher depth of coverage. And that certainly contributes to greater likelihood of high to moderate quality of ascertainment or designation by the next claim. So generally speaking, that's our cutoff moving forward. We started looking at the diversity. The first four months of 2021, when we were really ramping up the sequencing, and we observed some surprising trends. In New York State, it was actually the New York variant that stood out as the most abundant, whereas the rest of the country was experiencing an alpha surge. The New York variant is identified by the lineage B.1.526. The alpha, originally designated the UK, was the B117. And clearly, the race for New York had begun. You can see on these plots, we're going to see a number of these. What's plotted on the X is the number of mutations in the viral genome. And as a virus acquires more and more mutations, it may diverge enough in the areas of the genome that are mutating that it forms a new branch. So this is essentially like an ancestral family tree. And clearly, the iota was emerging in our population. But interestingly, the iota is very close to the epsilon. So the New York and the California are very close to each other on this branch, these tree branches, if you will. So we didn't know which was going to emerge, and we didn't know which one might continue to diverge the most. These mutations that are plotted, or the number of which is plotted in the last slide, are important because they affect, as you see on the right of this slide, the ability of the host to respond and the ability of antibodies and treatments to work. And many of these so-called variants of interest, like IOTA was, share some of the very same mutations in the spike protein that are considered high-impact mutations, and that was a concern. This is a geomap of the mutations and the variants that we observed most frequently in the first eight months of 2021. And you can see there is quite a bit of regional diversity, and this was unexpected. It was largely two epicenters where IOTA surged in our testing data. One was in the northeast corner of New York State in the upper part of the figure. And the purple slice of the pie indicates all of the IOTA or New York. Another epicenter was actually in downstate. And these areas are separated by hundreds of miles. They are connected by an interstate, but I don't think the viruses are hopping on that to travel back and forth. Yet these two sites mirrored each other quite a bit. Other parts of the state, you could see clearly, we're dealing primarily with alpha. And that's indicated by the red slices of the pie. And in the first eight months of 2021, toward the end of that summer, we're seeing the emergence of Delta. And it's not everywhere, but it's creeping up in certain locations. 
This is a plot of the top 12 lineages across time in the first eight months of 2021 with 90% of positive sequence. And as you can see, as we go from left to right along the bottom, clearly in the initial phases of the pandemic, some of the more ancestral lineages, the B1, B1.2, were struggling to get a foothold. In New York State, IOTA took over. And it probably attenuated the expansion of Epsilon or the California variant that was happening in other parts of the country. Those two together, especially IOTA, likely held off Alpha for a little while, but Alpha definitely expanded through late spring and into summer. Testing was reduced over the course of the summer. There were a lot fewer students on campuses, but they came back. They started to do pre-return testing, and that's when Delta definitely emerged in the late summer. Once the students were back, this is what happened on the campuses. The next 1,000 genomes showed this pattern. Clear emergence of Delta, you're seeing that at the top, and a marked reduction in anything else, a little bit of alpha remaining and some mu. We also note that there were more mutations occurring in the Delta lineage. What had started out as a strain that perhaps had 30 plus mutations was now showing branches that were encroaching on 50 or more mutations. And this is a concern. The system that we had developed for testing also enabled us to evaluate vaccine efficacy. And what we saw initially in the first half million tests, when you look in this table in the upper part of the slide, backed up what the manufacturer claims were for the different vaccines that had become available. We did this evaluation in early spring when approximately half of that half million students, faculty mostly, had been vaccinated. And so it was a deep data set. And we were able to determine, in fact, that the J&J &J vaccine did provide protection. One shot of an RNA vaccine, whether it was Pfizer or Moderna, provided approximately the same protection. And then two shots of Moderna or Pfizer provided 95 or 90% protection. And that supported the claims. But what we saw when we looked at the first 100,000 tests that had been performed during that Delta surge was a clear reduction in the efficacy. So J&J &J no longer provided any significant protection, just 10% efficacy. And the efficacy of the Moderna and the Pfizer full vaccine, as it was called, or two shot, as it's more accurately called, had been reduced by 35% in each case. We did see promising protection, however, being provided by those who had received a third shot, a booster shot of one of the RNA vaccines. So why this 35% reduction? Waning immunity is certainly part of it. And we actually evaluated saliva antibodies, IgA antibodies, IgG antibodies, IgM antibodies. They were tracked in our assay that we had fine-tuned and deployed. And so what you're looking at in this case, in the upper right of the slide, is the levels of antibody in a Pfizer-vaccinated population. That's the mean and the 90% confidence interval illustrating where people would expect their, their IgA, IgG, and IgM protection to be across time. And clearly, two months after vaccination is your peak protection. And that period of protection would extend three or four months, but eventually you would drop much lower. And this Delta surge was coinciding with the reduction in immunity that the people who had been vaccinated initially at the beginning of the year were showing. At the same time, there's an increasing number of Delta variant mutations going on. And we were able to observe that here plotting 
average number of amino acid mutations that were occurring in the sample data across time. And w with this increase in mutations, clearly we were going from the IOTA dominant New York State landscape to the alpha dominant and then the delta dominant by August. But this line, if you follow it out across time, would predict that we may be at 60 or more mutations by the end of the year. And this was a scary thought because everyone had pandemic fatigue by this point. In fact, everyone thought over the summer of 2021 that we were done until Delta hit. And that mentality reminded me of the movie Jurassic Park. And there's a scene in Jurassic Park the actor Jeff Goldblum was quoted when he asked a question about the dinosaurs not being able to reproduce because they were all female. He questioned that and said, life finds a way. Are you sure that's really going to be the case? And of course, we all know the dinosaurs had no problem reproducing. I think the virus is following suit and continuing to find a way to exist in the population. And increasing mutations is one way that it can help do that. The prediction of finding 60 or more mutations seems to have been met by the Omicron. Unanticipated, we had to expand testing and sequencing demand just a few months ago in order to meet volume needs that exceeded 10% of New York State's testing volume, if you exclude New York City. And that's what's shown, the gray line plus the percent. And that's continued through this day. This is an enormous amount of testing and an enormous amount of sequencing that we were obligated to perform as a follow-on, and it wouldn't have been possible to do without adopting a scalable technology like the SQL Plexwell platform. We also looked at the first indication of how protected people were against the Omicron that was emerging. And I'll point out in the upper left of this table, you can see that unvaccinated persons and people that had one shot or two shot, they all have the same percent positivity. And it wasn't until you get to the boosted individuals, three vaccination shot recipients, that you saw a reduction in that. And indeed, as of now, there is no protection from two vaccine shots against testing positives. There is protection against becoming severely ill, but it's harder to quantify that in simple terms. Positivity is what's shown here. So currently, three vaccine shots or a booster does provide protection, but it's nowhere near what it was. The likely explanation, definitely reduced immunity. Of course, pandemic fatigue and less social distancing measures, less masking, but also increased mutations. On this slide, you can now see the emergence of Omicron and the number of mutations it has right at that 60 mark. And that was exactly predicted back in the summer. Delta, you can see, is still found. This is the first week of January during all the testing and sequencing. Delta was still around. And there seemed to be two sets of deltas, some that had a lower number of mutations, and yet some that continued to mutate, but didn't adopt the same virulence as the Omicron. And even among Omicron, we had some samples showing up with far greater than 60. Here's some more reasons why mutations matter. You can see the spike protein shown here on the right of the slide. And everywhere there's a mutation, it's indicated by a colored vertical bar. Mutations showing up in the spike gene impact the ability of antibodies 
developed in response either to a prior infection or in response to a vaccine to prevent post cell infection. These mutations are compared to the reference sequence, but it is the reference sequence that the vaccines were raised against. You can easily appreciate how different a delta spike protein is and its pattern of mutations. There's three deltas on this slide compared to the Omicrons, which dominate the rest. Another reason why mutations matter is the appearance of mutations in PCR primer sites. And indeed, the Delta strain, just indicated with the arrows, has mutations in primer sites that impact one of the assays widely used in Europe and the China CDC assay. But Omicron has even more mutations, including mutations in the US CDC primer probe set, three mutations in the Chinese CDC probe set and the Europe probe set. China does not need less tensit test sensitivity at the moment. This could pose a major problem at helping control the positivity as they're now facing their Omicron crisis. As we look at February, we now see the complete elimination of Delta in the New York State testing population. Last time we detected Delta was the first two weeks of February. <laughs> we also see the emergence of the BA2 lineage of Omicron. And that's become more prominent later in February and continues to be so now. And look at the sheer number of mutations that are popping up in that BA2 compared to the BA1. If we look at the next slide, on the upper part of the slide, you're seeing, again, the spike gene. And all of those, the top two thirds of those sequences are from the more common BA1 Omicron lineage. But the bottom one is the BA2. And there's between nine and 11 very consistent changes in the spike protein compared to BA1. This is really a new variant entirely. It's not necessarily accurate to consider it just a sub lineage or a substrain because these mutations could impact infection, they could impact vaccine responsiveness in ways we don't fully appreciate yet. And yet it's predicted to continue changing. Here is a plot just through January and you can see the influx of the number of amino acid mutations. And that curve, and I don't show it through February, but it continues to rise. The number of amino acid mutations is rising and clear evidence that it's going from 60 in the original BA1 to now 80 or more in the BA2 should underscore the importance of continuing to monitor what's happening with this viral sequence. So we can look at our state data, and this is illustrative down here, and reevaluate what these peaks likely meant through our sequencing efforts. The initial spike that we were seeing from the pandemic when everyone thought it would be over soon, then the iota and epsilon surges, the alpha surge, the Delta surge and the Omicron surge. Fortunately, the PCR test that we developed has not been affected by any consistent mutation, and we don't see any effect on the PCR cycle to threshold in the BA2, the BA1 versus Delta or other strains. So we will continue to do our sequencing analyses and monitor as we go forward with no need to necessarily mo modify the PCR test at this time. But we do closely examine the PCR test for other trends. And one of those trends that's come up more and more now is the occurrence of recurrent positives. What I'm showing you here on this slide first is the test and retest positivity of individuals who are vaccinated or unvaccinated. And many people will get tested a second time they didn't trust the first result or they want to monitor their positive levels in order to get back to work as soon as possible. And so what you're seeing here is a trend for higher 
cycles to threshold, especially in the blue line in vaccinated persons, the virus is being eliminated, so it takes more cycles to show up versus a more flat line or a line in some cases that points downward for individuals who were not vaccinated and had trouble eliminating the virus. So this retesting recurrent positivity during the first literally three weeks has, reflects the same infection. But what we start to see looking out two, three months, and then nine, 12 months later, are these groupings of individuals, whether or not they were vaccinated or not previously, they were all infected previously, and they're getting the same viral load. There's no significant difference in the cycles to threshold the second or the third time that's happening. And this is now happening with Omicron. We're seeing people in March who actually were infected at the beginning of January or in late December. And they're coming in with the same cycles to threshold, the same viral loads that they had before. Why is this? Is it a failure to achieve an adequate host response and more mutations at the same time? We definitely wanted to gain more insight on this. So I'm excited to share just a little bit of our data with regard to immune profiling of the host response. Now, a word about saliva. Saliva isn't just harboring virus. Saliva is a rich antiviral media that is designed to contain antibodies, such as the IgA, immunoglobin alpha, secreted by cells around the salivary gland ducts. You can see in green all those cells. We also have Ig gamma or IgG secreting cells, the ones in red. And these are very important at neutralizing virus. So not surprisingly, if you quantify total amount of protein you find in normal adult human saliva, as we did in the lower left, you find immunoglobulins take up about 10% of all the protein there. But salivary gland ducts themselves, cells also express important immune class molecules that indicate they're involved in antigen presentation and neutralization, active neutralization of the virus. And of course, they express enzymes like RNAs that act on RNA viruses. So this convinced us we should be looking at saliva. We should see if there's host responses. And where we looked first was at RNA profiling in the same clinical samples that we had tested and sequenced. And this was done on a total of 192 subjects split into 12 groups of 16 matched for gender, age, race, and viral load. And it included unvaccinated persons with each of the major strains of interest, as well as fully vaccinated persons who had breakthrough infections. And the very initial comparison that we'd made of everyone was to the unvaccinated, never infected persons. So I'm just gonna share two data slides on results on the individual gene level and on the gene group level. In addition to comparing groups, group to group comparisons of everyone to the unvaccinated controls, we also looked for evidence of genes that had significant correlations with viral load. This is an example of some volcano plots, just showing you there were significant changes in every one of the comparisons. Just a few of those are shown here including just being fully vaccinated versus control. If you look at the overlap, the common changes, you can identify with all of those variants, a set of genes that appears to be viral infection specific. And I'm not showing you the gene symbols on the plot in the lower middle of this slide, but this is about a dozen different genes. And you can see it market increase with an infection in the blue line for all of these genes, a blunted increase in the gray line for people that received the vaccine but had breakthrough infection, and a complete flat line, the orange, no change in expression of these people who received just the vaccine. An example of the raw data, one of those genes shown on the lower right. So breakthrough with one shot, breakthrough with two shot, breakthrough from a Delta, breakthrough from an Omicron, there's an increase, 
it's much greater than the control vaccinated or control unvaccinated persons that are very flat. And there's a marked even greater increase you can see in people who had infection with one of the main variants of interest. So we're excited about that. We're just scratching the surface and we expect to do single cell sequencing, possibly even using some of the technology you heard Joe alluded to. One last data slide. When we look at the genes that were most correlated with viral load, I'm not showing you individual genes, but I'm just showing you the pathways that are enriched in those genes that had the highest robust correlations. And in saliva, it was very clear that there's entire sets of genes that are involved in host response, including trying to inhibit viral genome replication, defense response to virus. These are the two most enriched, most correlated of those genes that do show a strong correlation with viral load. So we have a lot to learn from saliva. We can learn much more than just the viral lineage there, much more than just the state of host immune response, but actually the viral infection response. So it was possible in our hands to have a positive, sustainable impact on public health through regular-based saliva testing. I didn't share the numbers with you, but our pool testing approach and the system that we rolled out resulted in 10 times less campus cases than the surrounding communities. We were able to take all of the positives and do full genome sequencing with the stabilized RNA, and it was certainly facilitated by adopting the scalable flexible approach. And Saliva itself has some interesting opportunities for monitoring antibody levels, as well as evaluating the host responses. Clearly, one of the lessons we've learned the most is the virus is not done mutating with us or with itself. And I would just thank all of these individuals listed here. It was a team effort, and there are many teams working on this. Thank you, Dr. Meller and Dr. Middleton, for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. Our first question asks, did you evaluate different pool sizes for pool testing? Is there a practical upper limit on effective pooling batch size? Thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is we did evaluate different pool sizes, but there are some excellent theoretical um, guidelines that we followed in evaluating those. You can see in this slide, there are different numbers of samples you might include in pools that de depend really on two principal factors. One is the positivity or the infection rate in an area. That's the first column you can see in those subtables. But the second is the variability in the positivity across pools. And what that means is some pools will have more than one positive person in them. If it's uniform and there's very low variability, and that's what all the models assumed up to this point, then you would choose pool sizes between 11 and 15, for example, when your positivity is between half and 1%. And you'd achieve efficiency of something close to seven, which means you're doing seven times less PCR to identify all the positives in that population. But in reality, pools don't have low variability. They tend to have moderate to high variability in congregated living um, situations. And so we did choose a pool size of 12, and that was based on our best estimates. And it turned out to yield an efficiency factor of around seven, um, as theoretically um, modeled by John Cohen. And if anyone's interested in further information, I'll refer you to his paper. You can see the citation for that at the bottom. Thank you. Our next question here asks, what is the maximum number of samples are you able to get on an ILMN flow cell during a sequencing run use Plexwell sequel? So Illumina flow cells um, have changed in their capacity. We use the NextSeq 2000 flow cells. And when we use the highest output, the P3 flow cells, we can run 24 plates at a time 
and achieve sufficient coverage to be able to have a minimum of 50 read depth across 95% of the genome in all of those samples. Great, thank you. All right, this next question asks, how did your lab adapt to your sequencing efforts with the emergence of Omicron variants? Were there changes you need to make to panels used? Actually, that's an excellent question. Each time that new variants or new mutations have arisen, it's caused um, a lot of people to closely examine how well the Arctic PCR primer pools are performing and other pools that are used for sequencing as well. And I can tell you that the Arctic V4 does not perform optimally, but V4.1 restores that. And so we have adapted as the community of sequencers um, have adapted those protocols. Great, thank you. Another question here asks, do you ever anticipate to see a decrease in the number of mutations in the future? That's an excellent question. Unfortunately, I don't think mutations go away um, unless there's an incredible selection power uh, it, present against the emergence of new mutations. And RNA viruses are notorious for just gaining more and more mutations. But if some virus did emerge that happened to have fewer mutations that had selective advantage over other more variable variants, then we might see that emerge. But it's, it's hard to envision that happening. Thank you. Looks like we have time for one more question here. And this last one asks, what do you see as other areas of high potential future impact beyond COVID for saliva-based disease monitoring? So we've certainly been very interested in looking at human diseases um, and human conditions using saliva monitoring, and it runs the gamut. So we've done work in concussion, we've done work in autism, we've done work in Parkinson's disease, and we've done work in other infectious diseases besides just COVID. And we're very encouraged by our work in all of those areas that indicate we can monitor what is present in saliva, whether it's the microbiome or uh, inclusive of viruses that we could resequence if we so choose, or if it's the host that we're more interested in and looking at things like the microRNA or the messenger RNA as we did in the case of our COVID work in particular. So the sky might be the limit. Uh, there are a lot of different scenarios where you can imagine saliva testing to be utilized because it is so easy to acquire. And if you stabilize the saliva, it can actually yield a great deal of information for a minimal investment. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Miller and Dr. Middleton, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Sequel, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Until next time, take care, everyone. Goodbye.